So I used to walk by the Newsweek office at, at uh, Pennsylvania Avenue and I'd go up and see if he was ready to go to lunch. So this day I had called him and said I'd be over for lunch. I get over and his girl was sitting there in the lobby and of course I knew where to go and everything and she's crying. I said, Mary, what's the matter? She said, go in his office. So I go in the office and here's this uh, sheetrock wall with a hole big enough for that picture to go through sideways. I mean, straight forward. I said, what the hell is that? She said, that's where his typewriter went. I said, why? They said they had asked him to do the lead story for Monday morning uh, Newsweek issue, and, and this was Monday. He worked late Friday night. He got it done Saturday, and they said they cut it over the weekend, and it was a real important story. Nick, Nick did the big ones, and the, the, the top guys wouldn't have it. And so that's where his typewriter went. He grabbed his hat, and he left. A couple of days later, he's editor of the New York Times. I mean, he was that type of, he could work for anybody, you yeah, see. Familiar, Just yeah. buy him a new, new uh, typewriter. New typewriter. He, he was... Uh, through, uh, through his own wall, though, not through their wall. Well, well, it was, it was, it, it was, uh, well, I don't know about there, it was their office, you oh, know. Oh, okay, yeah, he was, in the, he was in the office, oh, yeah. okay, I thought it was his house. No, he was downtown in the office. Oh, good, good for him. Well, he's that kind of a guy. <clears throat> well, we need more of those kind of reporters. You know, as I understand mm -hmm. it, the, the reporters don't get, you know, people are blaming the press for everything, mm. for, the, for the fact that we don't know what's going on in our country. And I heard somebody very, very eloquently describe the fact that it isn't the reporter's fault necessarily that, that they're writing crummy work. The editors and the publishers are spike everything they don't like. They won't print, they that's edit right. everything. Sure. The worst thing is omission. Yeah. See, you, you can have a story... But if you can't tell anybody, that's a worse thing because it's a story that needs to be known. And, and they use omission more than anything else today. That's why isn't there a clearinghouse for reporters who get their stories spiked, who can then take their stories and say, okay, I want you to publish it in well, your magazine yeah, nobody, or whatever? Nobody's got the guts. In fact, I got a letter, I got a letter today from the crowd that is causing one of the problems. <clears throat> yeah. Do you know that organization? I've heard of them. Yeah. A seven hundred million dollar endowment. Imagine for people that really don't do much of anything. Seven hundred million dollar endowment. Seven hundred million. And it again, it you know. Look at the uh, the picture on the T-shirt. Yeah. Does your T-shirt have freedom of speech? But um, I go to, uh, I get invitations to go to certain of their lectures, always good, you know. But they're never, I mean, it isn't even controversial, they're never educational, they're just kind of pleasant. Like this, what's the guy that was the reporter in Baghdad, is it Terry Anderson? Terry Anderson? Yeah, you wouldn't know he'd been to a war, it sounded like he went to a picnic, you know, the way he described the thing and all that sort of stuff. It, it, it's... Um, but it's interesting to go because you you got to keep up with what the other guys are doing. You know that's why I go. Where's your, one of your JFK books? Oh, uh, well, the the black and white. The what, but you don't. I don't. Oh, there's a German. Yeah, oh, hey, open the open the door. There's a German version, huh? Yeah, here. Op, op, the CSA, the there. Okay. So they're, they're, <laughs> nah, take your choice. <laughs> I'm afraid those may be the last I'm ever going to get. But uh, anyway, for whatever, you can do what you want with it. <laughs> oh, that's funny. What do you know about the this the new hemp movement to take hemp and make it a a uh, well? The research on it is that it's the finest fabric the finest paper source and the finest fuel source in the world. And that when hemp was outlawed in the 30s... Yeah, that's a terrible thing. And, yeah. and now they're growing it all over the world again. They're growing it's it. It's the biggest crop in Virginia today. Today? Hemp? I didn't know that. Illegal, but it's the biggest crop. Because, oh, you know, yes. it grows like a, it's a weed. It's a weed, sure. And uh, when my dad, my dad's work, he, he was in uh, uh, heavy forestry work, big trees, work with ropes all the time. If it wasn't a hemp rope, he wouldn't buy it. Sure. 
It's the only trustworthy rope there is. It's the longest fiber in the world yeah. or something like that. Cotton's got a fiber like this, yeah. hemp's got a fiber and, like this. And uh, the nylon ropes they make expand, and when the rope breaks, it'll break a man's leg. You know, come right yeah, back at him. Whip. Hemp wouldn't do that. Oh, hemp, hemp is priceless stuff. It's a shame. See, this that's what I mean about the food problem and everything. The, the basic necessities of our life, uh, we, we've spent civilization learning what cures a pain they got they got they know which route to get when i when we first moved here the, the part over back there was all woods because it had yeah. been an estate here that wasn't used you've been here a long time and the chinese people began to live in a development over the hill they flocked over there there's a there's a uh, a very nice area of apartments and they seem to have money but it's all a lot of chinese there and I'd look out here about walking my dog, and I'd see these people in the bushes on, the, on their hands and knees digging up stuff, and it was sassafras. Huh? The, 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 when, when this state was first uh, found by the English and began to be organized, the ships going to England for trade carried more sassafras than anything else. People thought they carried tobacco, but that was later on. Sassafras has more of the ingredients of it. You have to have the root. Uh, it's better for you medicinally than almost anything else you could find. Well, the Chinese would be on their hands and knees digging it up, whereas the rest of us would be walking past it, didn't even know. Well, they, you know, we've spent all the time man's been on earth to find the best things that do everything, like hemp rope and sassafras and so on. Now we're burying it all, you know, and, and people, you tell somebody about sassafras today and they might remember that there's a drink called sarsaparilla, but that's as much as they know. It, you it, don't even hear about sarsaparilla anymore. No. That's, that's something from the past. Or moxie. Boy, you know, moxie used to, you got, you got a lot, you know, moxie was a real drink. I don't know whether your age. I've heard of it, you know, but I don't know whether it was, was it sarsaparilla? I, I never, I never heard, yeah, sarsaparilla, no, moxie was, I don't know the ingredients, but it was a good, it was a good soft drink. And I never heard of Coca-Cola when I grew, I grew up in New England and, and we never heard of Coca-Cola up in New England, but we have moxie all the time. Huh. <clears throat> Amazing. Colonel, what do you know about about tungsten in Vietnam? When I was studying mm -hmm. Vietnam back in the 60s, I read some articles that they were mining tungsten out of Vietnam and that it was because it's essential for gun barrels and things like that, that they were mining it like crazy. Well, uh, tungsten is a very valuable metal that we have very little of. It just happens that way. And uh, one of the sources has been the Soviet Union, but with, we have difficulty sometimes getting it from the Soviet Union under present conditions. And Vietnam was another area, but wherever there is tungsten, we go after it. I think another big one is uh, either Niger or, or uh, Nigeria, down in that area somewhere in the middle of Africa, there's a tungsten. So, uh, see, Vietnam, a lot of people forget the, the antecedent in Vietnam. The French were there for about 100 years. Now, the French were, were real savvy about things like mining and all that. That's why they went. That's why the, the British, why all these people went to these other countries was the, 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 they figured the property was free. They, you know, they didn't honor anybody's title to property. In fact, the, the idea of owning property didn't occur to the, the older groups of people. And they didn't live in a flat world. They just lived on what they were there. You know, it didn't bother them what's on past the horizon. And until Magellan went around the world, or his his people did, he never came back. Um, people didn't think of property. If you didn't like your neighbors, you just moved a little bit. See, well, the same with mining. Uh, I've been in a place in Africa where a man was working on a log hammering out gold into jewelry and stuff, right sitting at this log with a couple of little boys over here working a pump to keep the, the gold melt molten for him or soft. And then, by God, while I'm standing there watching him and my co-pilot, he signals to the boys, they run down and there's a hole over back there and they're gone for a while. It's a mine. And down in that mine, they hammer on the wall, get some what come up, they put the rocks in a pan, begin them, and gold comes out. Now, of course, I'm interested in the, the jewelry process, and I'm interested in the little fire. 
But I keep thinking, what the heck's at the end of the tunnel down there? <laughs> These guys, and this is just a daily business, a couple of little fellows in the middle of Africa. I still know where it is. I think I'll go there someday. <laughs> but you see, they knew where it was, and yet it didn't mean it, there was no great big factory. There weren't walls and fences around it. The guys just working. In fact, that's how we found him. We were in a cocoa plantation, and we heard the hammering. We heard... And then we wondered what the heck it was. See, and we see the little guy sitting there. Well, when the first explorers went running around, they found things like that. They said, well, this is mine. You know, just who, who do you deal with? Nobody. This is mine. From that mentality, they began to build up what was around the world. And the French began to realize that the Garden of Eden on the United on the world was S Southeast Asia, specifically Indochina. And... Uh, you know, like the Agent Orange problem. The Michelin people had their rubber plantation in Vietnam. We destroyed it. That's why we had to let Michelin come into the United States to do business. Before that, we never gave them a, a, a license to do business in the United States because Firestone and Goodyear and so on. And Bobby Kennedy had to arrange with Michelin for the losses that we suffered in, uh, they suffered in Vietnam from Agent Orange uh, to, okay, open up a factory down in South Carolina. So all that stuff goes. It isn't just tungsten. You see, I'm beating around the bush, but it isn't just tungsten. It's the whole darn thing uh, in Indochina had been pretty well categorized. With, they, were, they were the biggest high-grade rice exporters in the world before the Vietnam War, that kind of thing. It was a very valuable country. I have a, Ge a National Geographic magazine from the 30s that calls Vietnam the the uh, Garden of Eden, yeah, the, 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 you know, the best best place on earth. Well, did you see Oliver Stone's uh, new film, Heaven and Earth? Um, I forget which. The film on Vietnam, where yeah, I, I saw that one. Yeah, it opens up with uh, the the girl who wrote the book yeah. saying, "When I grew up, I thought I lived in the most beautiful country in the world." Yeah, and they open up with a, a very beautiful. Yeah. Uh, seed of, of the countryside in Vietnam. Yeah. And it was exquisite. It was as beautiful as she thought it was. And I started to cry immediately because I knew what was going to come. Yeah. That we were going to hear helicopters and then we were going to hear... And, uh, yeah, it was a garden spot. But why... I could, down there I've got uh, thousands of, of color slides and I could show you pictures I took in Vietnam in 1952 when it was a Garden of Eden. Beautiful. They called Saigon the Paris of the Orient, only it was prettier than Paris. It was beautiful. And one of the things you'd see is down the main street, the most uh, frequent um, individual marketplaces were flowers, just all over the place, flowers. And you fly to the coast. <clears throat> when men were injured in the Korean War and uh, had to have a long period of recuperation, we would fly them. I was a commander of a, of a heavy transport squadron. We would fly them from Tokyo on military orders to Vietnam to take them to the beach for rehabilitation. The hell with the war. You know, no war, at least not there. there was no war was in the north between, at that time, between the North Vietnamese and the French. But South Vietnam was uh, open. I flew over North Vietnam and we got shot at, but uh, not South Vietnam. But we, we sent our soldiers down there. They got Vietnam duty, but it was to go to a resort. See, uh, it was a beautiful place, and it was just as there was absolutely mindless to destroy it. <clears throat> when uh, when Kissinger and Nixon uh, carpet bombed uh, parts of Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia, uh, that was absolutely criminal because they can't grow crops anymore. The, the ground is all dug up. And like I say, the, the Michelin people, we, we destroyed their rubber plantation. That's amazing. So who, but with getting back to the tungsten for just a second, just for the last part of it, who was doing the mining of it? I mean, was it just an American mining effort or was it a, a joint... Well, uh, before, oh, thank you, before the, by the way, get yourselves whatever you want. It's just a regular refrigerator. Get in it. Maybe an apple or something, Pat, for me? 
Uh, gee, I don't have. A, I got. A, I have an orange, but oh. right, right now she's on her way buying apples, and oh. I'm sorry. Uh, in fact, we're going to buy apples tomorrow. Um, okay. Uh, I think you would find that Vietnam, before we got in there, uh, it was pretty much a French corporation. I mean, almost all the things being done there were French. And, uh, in fact, it's most likely one of the reasons for the Vietnam War was to get the French out of there and get our businesses in there, because on more than tungsten is the oil. There's enormous oil finds that already have been located off the coast of Vietnam. So the assets of Vietnam were what we would gain from the war, and our companies are moving in there now uh, and taking over. You mentioned, uh, speaking of oil, you mentioned in one of your last talks that petroleum wasn't what we thought it was, that it wasn't a fossil fuel, that it didn't come from fossil animals. <laughs> yeah. Is it just a mineral? Is it a mineral like any other mineral? Is that, is that how it, is that how it uh, what would you say? Uh, how did it, what's the origin it, of, of you see, petroleum? <clears throat> when they first found petroleum, uh, because they were beginning to make motors and, and, and needed it on axles and wheels and railroad trains and all that sort of thing, and remember, trains started in the beginning of the 19th century, then oil went from a, just a lubricant to a fuel, and it made it valuable. And Rockefeller happened to be the smartest man in the business at the time, but he made a lot of most of his money, or much of it, off the transport of the petroleum as well as selling it. But <clears throat> one thing they realized was, if you, because oil, uh, oil is uh, putting a price on oil is like putting a price on a pail of water. You know, the, the, no, no initial cost is in the ground, and, and in those days they were some of it almost what you'd call surface mining the oil. They didn't go down deep. So in order to get the price up. They hit on the idea that they would have to make it appear to be scarce. That, they, that boy, after we take the next few barrels out, we're probably going to have to close as well. You know, that kind of thing. But a very fortuitous event. In 1892, there was a convention in Geneva of, of scientists to determine what organic substances are. Well, the definition of organic is a substance with hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. And so it's usually a living substance, a tree. You analyze a dead tree, hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen, and grass, and so on, living things. Animals, we are, hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. So at this Geneva Convention, Rockefeller took advantage of sending some scientists over who said, oil, petroleum, is hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. Therefore, it must be derived from the, uh, the spoiling, the rotting of formerly living matter. And uh, playing the game properly, when the this scientific convention was over, they defined oil as a, the residue from formerly living matter. Well, that makes it a fossil fuel. I don't know why they decided to use the word fossil, but it says formerly living matter is fossil. Well, of course, today, and, and, and another thing we should know is that there has never been a fossil, a, a, a real fossil, found below 16,000 feet. And you can't argue at 16,000 as a level line because someplace the ground sinks and so on. But 16 is what the scientists say, 16,000. We mine oil, or we, we drill for oil, at 30,000, 33,000, 28,000 every day of the week. So right there, we rule it out that it isn't fossil fuel. It's called fossil fuel for the minds of the public to feel that it is a, a, an asset that is running out, being depleted. We talk about depletion allowance, which is a lot of, you know. And actually, if you know the world's oil supply, you know that it is not going to run out for an awfully long time. It is the second most prevalent liquid on earth and, and we haven't begun to dig. Well, with all that background, you see, the people in charge of the petroleum business for perfectly reasonable business uh, things, like any other man in a business, wants to keep his price as high as he can get away with and the way to do is just say, well, there's no more. We, 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 the last barrel is going to cost a thousand dollars and then it's all done. 
and and they preach that stuff. What bothers me is that that in geology books, it's in there. The geologists say it's a fossil fuel. They, they've somehow they've been bought. I mean, you, I I went to a four-year federal staff energy seminar run by the government of the United States during the so-called energy crisis. I was the participant that represented the railroad industry. The airline industry was there. Every AA administrative assistant of senators and congressmen was there. The CIA was there. The Defense Department was there. The State Department was there. Sometimes sitting right in front of me in the row would be Henry Kissinger with his friend, um, uh, the, the head of the uh, Department of Defense. Uh, uh, that's too bad. I can't put the names with them. But anyway, people like that, top men in the government sitting there listening to the Federal Staff Energy Seminar. Well, what this was doing is for four years they were teaching a propaganda line to the leading people in this country and therefore to the leading people in the world when you include the Hissinger, uh, Schlesinger, Kissinger and Schlesinger among others. And the object of it was as Kissinger used in his own terms when it was time for him to speak, to create a world price for oil. In other words, not uh, 30 cents a gallon here and 90 cents a gallon there, but let's get a world price. That's their goal, and they're trying to do that for wheat and everything else. We don't realize what, it, what the controls are, whether it's oil or some of these other things. Almost everything today is being categorized at the highest price they can possibly make it go. And so calling petroleum a fossil fuel is the basis for th this system uh, with respect to petroleum. Nice. And, and I went, I don't know if the name Arthur Kantrowitz rings any bell. Arthur Kantrowitz <clears throat> is the head of the Kantrowitz Labs set up by the uh, AFCO company uh, near Boston, uh, Scientific Laboratories and um, a great man in the scientific world. And Kantrowitz and I were sitting at a table at this uh, seminar once, and the table happened to be all young college grad PhD geologists. And so just to get a conversation started, I turned to Kantrowitz and I said, Arthur, what do you think about this foolishness of these speakers talking about fossil fuel? And uh, it was kind of put up. He started laughing. He said, you know, that gets me. He said, he says, I don't, he said, I don't have a geology degree, but he had a thousand other degrees. And he said, I don't understand. He said, you'd think and these heads, these other fellows at the table, we did it on purpose, start <laughs> listening, you know. And he asked, he said, uh, are you gentlemen? He says, you're here at the meeting. Are you gentlemen by any chance geologists? And one fellow, yes, I am. And the other, yeah. he said, well, why don't you tell me? He said, why, why is, why is, oh, you know, and he went on like that. We brought the house down because nobody could argue with a cantorist. He like, he like Einstein. People aren't going to, and he told him right there. He said, just drop it. But it's, it's in all the books and in all the papers. But it started from that strange meeting in 1892 a scientific convention. In G I have a big, thick scientific encyclopedia put out by the Devon Ostern Company that's about oh, 15 years old now, but it has the whole story of the conference. It doesn't have the Rockefeller part, but it has the whole story of how they straightened out organic chemicals and how it was all figured, and they've got petroleum right in there. Amazing. Amazing. So <laughs> These aren't accidental things, you see. There's a dollar sign behind almost everything. Yeah. Speaking of dollar signs behind everything, I've had a question I've been curious about for a long time. As I understand it, Lyndon Johnson's first act when he became president, before <coughs> 273, before any of the, the moves that we've heard about, was to rescind the Treasury Act, uh, 11121 or something, I can't remember the numbers, that Kennedy signed into, into effect in uh, April 63, I think it was where Kennedy put the, the power for minting money back into the hands of the Treasury Department and took it out of the hands of the Federal Reserve. What, what do you know about that act? And was that Johnson's <laughs> first move to rescind that act? Well, remember, the word act means it was legislation. A, a president can sign an executive order, and it has the impact of act oh, as, long, as long as okay. he can get it to stand that way, as long as he's president, you might say. There are a lot of executive orders. They, they use that and abuse it now more than they do other things. It wasn't debated in Congress. 
But the way the Federal Reserve System is set up and things like that, it's not uh, too unusual to find that the president uh, uses that kind of uh, a, a, a paper, an order, a directive to get certain things done. Now, with respect to the Federal Reserve, uh, uh, since it's not truly a function of the government, then a presidential uh, directive would be the, the paper. And at that time, dollar bills came out that would be refundable in silver. I still have a few of them that sure. I kept for souvenirs. Everybody's kept and, uh, you know, even a Kennedy has a problem fighting City Hall. Uh, the Federal Reserve System is pretty strong. But it was one of the things, of course, like he was also reducing seriously the oil depletion allowance. That was another thing he was cutting down. So, and this is really a characteristic of the Kennedy period. He and his advisors, principal among them his father, who was a pretty brilliant old boy and a tough son of a gun, and, and, uh, and very much in the business world, were doing things that you might say were a throwback to the Roosevelt era or even further back to basic government. And uh, this, of course, built Kennedy, an awful lot of very serious enemies who were enemies from the point of view that they, he must not be reelected in 64. That was their, they could not permit him to get over 1964 because the second four years a president is beholden to nobody. He's not going to get, you know, and Kennedy knew that. He, he's the one that said over and over again, it's an old Kennedy saying, not to get bad, but to get even. He said, what I'm doing is I'm not going to get even. He said, but you watch me after 64. Then he said, I'll take care. Well, he'd, he'd tell people that kind of half joking, but half serious. Yeah. And that's what caused people to rise against him because on every side, whether you're in the petroleum business or the banking business or in the military or, or expecting this or that, Kennedy was putting things back where they had been and not playing favorites quite as strongly as, say, the... Eisenhower administration had been doing before him. And I think that's the basis of what you're talking about, because it was just an executive uh, paper from the White House. But uh, that's a, thank you. I've always wondered about that. <clears throat> and I wondered if it was Johnson's very first move, you know, if there was some kind of an imperative that Lyndon felt he had to erase that act uh, first, among all the other important things he had to do the first couple of days of his presidency. That must have been very powerfully well, uh, motivated. You see, because what did Johnson? People <clears throat> have haven't thought enough about Johnson in the assassination. First of all, it's the first time a president in the hundred years of Secret Service had been in the same motorcade or parade or building with the president. Right. That that's just not permitted. And here's Lyndon sitting back there, two cars behind the president. The other thing is, we know the trajectory of some of the bullets pretty clearly. And one of them, the tag bullet, obviously, or, and, and the one in Kennedy's back, I think, went over Johnson, went, went over Johnson maybe 18 inches. I had, I, when I was writing something on this back in 1975, I think it was, or maybe earlier, I had a draftsman figure the trajectory for me, and we figured Lyndon was only about 18 inches under the bullet. And you know, his first meeting with Edgar Hoover after the assassination, and Hoover had been his neighbor in Washington for 19 years. They weren't strangers to each other, and they weren't the president and another guy. They were old friends. They borrowed each other's lawnmowers, you know. Well, the first meeting with him, he's, the first thing he said was, how many shots were fired? And Hoover said, well, we've got three cartridges, three shots. And then Johnson came right back and said, were any fired at me? Well, in the first week after that horrible episode, you can be sure that whatever paper came on his desk, he was thinking about the sound of those bullets because they lowered that gun a little bit and they had him. And, and look at the record afterwards. Nixon had trouble with the shots. Ford had trouble with shots. I mean, they kept those guys in line. And, and uh, so I wouldn't take the Johnson period, at least uh, the first six months, and then a little after that he got out, <laughs> more than six months, but as being his own initiative. I think he was following the initiative or the instructions of the people that saw to it that Kennedy was out of office. As powerful as Johnson was. Oh, well, he wasn't, had no power. See, he lost the power with those bullets. No, you're not powerful after bullets go over your head. You know that. 
What kind of power does he have? He just got the job. He's got the title. But think of the things he did. He reversed the 263, the, the, the Kennedy policy, in two days, four in four days, I should say. No, he, he was. That's that's what bothered him. He was not powerful. See, and then a man like Johnson, hard to live with because he'd been powerful before that. Well, that's what I've been. You know, you but know, we have to be realistic that. about these things. Is that why maybe he thought he thought enough to say that there was a conspiracy? Before he died, well, <clears throat> I'm sure he knew that the minute the bullets went off. I mean, I'm just sure he knew that because he'd say, geez, what am I doing here? See, I like that. And why was Connolly, the governor, in the same car? Well, maybe that seems nice politically, but even so, the Secret Service usually keeps the targets separated. But uh, I, I don't think Johnson had a lot of choices, and I don't think he was truly, characteristically Johnson in that era right afterwards. I think he'd got his mind changed on a lot of things in a big hurry. When Lansdale retired, as I understand it, when Lansdale sent you down to New Zealand, and then no, he retired. Yeah, but uh, we'll put that in, in clearer term. People have abused that business. <laughs> Lansdale and I had known each other since 1952. And Lansdale heard that I was going to be going down to New Zealand because the Joint Chiefs of Staff were sending, a, a, what do you call it, a, an officer to go with a bunch of businessmen, see, escort officer. And he, he says, I know the guys, and, and I, I'll, I'll make sure you get your orders and all that. But he, see, he worked for the Secretary of Defense. I worked for the Joint Chiefs. We weren't, we weren't even in, in the same level of work. We were in completely different offices. Yeah, he, people think he was my boss at the time, and I'd like to straighten the record out. He wasn't. And, and he was just an old friend. Hell, I'd known him uh, 60, from 52 to, to 63, 11 years. We'd visit each other's homes. Wives knew each other, you know, that sort of relationship. I'd, I'd be on a flight. He'd come in the airplane with me. He wasn't a pilot, but to travel somewhere. So he knew I was going to schedule to go, and he knew people to talk to about it. And that, that was just it. He, he was, it wasn't his doings as such. But I did notice he seemed more interested in it than normal, so I had a little feeling that there was something in it that interested him. And uh, uh, I just wanted to straighten that out because some of the writers have really screwed that up pretty badly. What kind of a guy was he? I mean, was he, uh... he was a genius. See, see we, we, our country sent him to the Philippines to, to remove a president from the Philippines, Quirino, that was no longer acceptable. It's one of the few times that a man in a position like that wasn't just murdered and thrown out. Lansdale created the successor from this man, Meg Saisai, who at that, when he first went down to Meg Saisai, was a captain in the army. Captain. A, a captain in the army. Built him up, built him up. He got to be Secretary of Defense in the army. Well, of course, with U.S. help and everything in the Philippines, that's not hard to do with U.S. dollars. Like Lansdale told me, he said, I did it with a blank checkbook. He said, that's all they, did they give you guns and all that stuff? No, he just blank checkbook. Everything went fine. He was happy with the job. And uh, he, he, so he used his power, but he used his good sense. Like there was a so-called opposition, the communist opposition down they called the hooks. Well, he took advantage of that. He'd get, he'd get McSaisai to be the, 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 the head of a, bata a battalion, say a thousand men. The night before, half of the battalion would go out in the bush and attack a village, uh, and not in uniform. And in the morning at sunrise, the, the, the other half, the loyal half, would make. So I saw up front would come in and drag guys out of the village, you know, and burn down some huts and everything. And everybody would run like wild. And then the... And finally, McSaisai would round up the chieftain and say, hey, we're, we're, the, we're the loyalist people. Come on back. Get everything safe. We've captured the guys. They would actually have execution things. They'd shoot at the guy. The guy would fall dead. They'd throw him in a truck. they shot with blank bullets. I mean, Lansdale never overlooked anything. And, it was, and, they, and of course, when all this was going on, who's the other half of the battalion? Oh, they're hooks. Oh, those communists that live in the bushes and that kind of stuff. It's clever. Good scenario. And he kept doing that enough times so that the people, people that had never bothered to vote before and all that kind of stuff up in the bush, thought this Mag Saisai is just wonderful guy, see? Meanwhile, uh, Lansdale's off on the side somewhere playing his harmonica with his friends. And, but it was sm another thing he did that they don't usually write about is he had a lot of movie projectors. And he would send men into towns showing movies 
that, among other things, is like evening TV, see, but it was just on a movie, and among other things, showing what a great guy Meg Sai Sai was, and then maybe some little marginal kind of about Corino really not such a good, you know, he couldn't attack him, but, you know, maybe we ought to get rid of this guy. Oh, Meg Sai Sai be one of the people, you know, coming up. And the way he did it, he just, when they counted the votes, Meg Sai Sai had so many votes, he just swamped Carino. And Carino left because of a vote, not because of a bullet. Well, that was, that's, that's kind of a job. You know, we should have done that with Castro, see? Uh, we'd get Castro out that way. Now, wasn't, because uh, the hooks were, the hooks were actually a, a common, they were all, well, the, they, they were the, before, the basic he hooks, yeah, he just took advantage of it. See, any opposite, just like here, when uh, Joe McCarty would get mad at somebody, call him a communist. Well, Lansdale would get mad at somebody or getting Mag Sai Sai mad at a, at a tribe somewhere. He'd say, well, they're hooks. Let's go after them, see? But a lot of it was, he used to tell me <laughs> how they staged some of this stuff. And they'd start with the movie theaters, you know, and get the people thinking. And then the, it always happened that the town that had the movies showing, and he'd say what they'd do is just go downtown and show the movies on the side of a building or something, but all the natives would come in, see? And he said, <laughs> but if they ever noticed it, it was always where they showed the movies and where Mag Sai Sai had come just to see the people, that all of a sudden the hooks attack. So it just all kind of went together, that kind of stuff. And he had the agency behind him, but even that was funny. His worst enemy in Manila was the station chief of the agency because Lansdale didn't realize it, but they hadn't told the station chief that this guy was coming in to do this. They were operating like two units there, and finally... <laughs> Lansdale told me one day, he said, I wouldn't be surprised that bastard shoots me <laughs> because he knew he was really mad at him. But they got that squared away after they realized the problem. It was all done. He was really working almost alone, but he had some very, very close, powerful friends in the, in the lower level Philippine government like Meg Sai Sai and people like that. And he treated them so well that they just, a fellow named Valeriano, uh, actually Valeriano, you know, and we don't hear much about this, was training uh, Cuban exiles uh, before the Bay of Pigs. And, and uh, he gave them actual, practical, down-to-earth training about how you overthrow somebody because Valeriano had been the guy that worked with Lansdale to overthrow Quirino, and they figured he's a natural. We had aircraft from the Philippines, and we had people from the Philippines helping on the Bay of Pigs. The, I don't think anybody's ever written about that. Was it Lansdale who, who pulled the... He, I mean, he sounds like a master psychological Yeah, that's his big what they call unconven uh, uh, unconventional warfare. Was he the one that got a million people to move from one part of the country to the other yeah. by telling them that the in, Virgin in, Mary in, had appeared somewhere? In, yeah, in, uh, in Vietnam. Yeah. And, you know, people laugh at that. But, you know, I, I have a copy of a speech made by John Foster Dulles in um, uh, 19, 1953 in which he states that over a million North Vietnamese have been moved to South Vietnamese because the poor people can't live with communism. You know, well, what it was is Lansdale and his people called the Saigon Military Mission made it so damned uncomfortable for them that they left. And our Navy transported 660,000 North Vietnamese from the North to the South. Well, then we have to think now. These are people that their ancestors had lived on little farms they lived on little farms, and they had what they call ancestor worship. They wouldn't leave the farm because their ancestors were buried there, and they left. I mean, that's been an awful lot of pressure, a lot, and it was psychological pressure, a lot of it. And they got on Navy ships and went to South Vietnam. 330,000 were moved by uh, CIA's airline, CAT airline. And then when Dulles gave this speech at the American Legion Convention on the 2nd of September in 1953, uh, which, by the way, is the Japanese surrender date, and it is the date that Ho Chi Minh founded Vietnam, a very important date to Southeast Asia. When he gave that speech, he said that 1,100,000 Tonkinese have been moved to the south, and we're taking care of them there. Well, when you get people like that down there and you kick them off the Navy ship, where are they going to eat that night? Sure. You know? Well, they were supposed to have, like, camps set up that they could go to. But most times they found out that the people they gave uh, $3,000 to to feed these guys had taken off with the $3,000. Well, they didn't give a damn. So those people started right away by being hostile to South Vietnam. They're not 
close to each other anyway. They are different people, and they've always been different people uh, in their own upbringing through thousands of years. And so it was a hostile situation. So they became, by definition, bandits. They had to steal to eat and, and or to survive. So then what our people did was call them the Viet Cong. And we called them the insurgents. Then we had counterinsurgency. Well, the agency created all that with Lansdale's unit, the Saigon Military Mission. And that's how the war got... You see, the war didn't really start until 1965. The first military troops under military commanders landed in Vietnam in 1965. And yet, we had an American Army general there in September 45. The first American killed in Vietnam was in September 45. But all of that period, from 45 to 65, was under CIA operation. People, most people don't realize that. Uh, there was a British general who I saw interviewed uh, when the Japanese surrendered in Saigon, and he was interviewed by someone, and he was saying that he didn't know who to give the power to there. He didn't know who to hire as police in mm -hmm, Vietnam mm -hmm. because uh, uh, he didn't know the people very well, but he knew that the Japanese had all surrendered their weapons. Mm -hmm. They were very very compliant, is that the word? Mm -hmm. and, and so he thought, well, better than trust the Vietnamese who he didn't know to police themselves and to be their own policemen, he gave the, he picked the weapons back up and gave them to the Japanese and said, okay, I want you to be the police here for a while. And Ho Chi Minh, when he found out about this, he, he felt he was completely betrayed. He thought, we fought this <laughs> war for, for God knows how long, and now when we finally take power or when we finally should take power, you give it to the very people that have been oppressing us. And as I understand it, that was the beginning of Ho Chi Minh's turning on us because didn't he... <coughs> well, he, he had problems with the French traditionally. But I mean the and, Americans. Uh, yeah, but, but we were there in the beginning and we, ar we armed his troops. We brought about... Um, <laughs> just close the door and I think you'll be all right. <laughs> uh, we, we, we brought about uh, 250,000 arms and gave them, the, the invasion force arms for Japan, we gave them to Ho Chi Minh. And he equipped his people um, uh, under uh, Colonel Giap to create his army and to support the new government he was starting. And he was working right with us in that period. Then he went to France to some meetings, hopefully, he thought, for the French to recognize his sovereignty and to get out because it had been agreed at the Tehran Conference in 43 that colonialism would end in South Asia. The Dutch would get out of Indonesia and the British get out of India and all this. It had been agreed and they thought the French would get out. So that there was already a lot of planning for that. But that explains why our country so early armed and equipped Ho Chi Minh because it had been agreed that, he, that the Vietnamese would run their own government. It was that. The English general that came in came in with the Burma troops that had crossed through from Burma, Thailand, into Vietnam, and they were down in the south. Well, that's 1,600 miles away. They hadn't closed. There was no way they were closing yet. And, and he was there on September 10th, but by September 20, 22nd, something like that, the French were beginning to come in. And he very gladly turned it over to French because the French had always run the constabulary in Vietnam. And so they began running the police function. Well, with the police function goes the military function. And then due to the way Ho Chi Minh was treated at this conference in France, the French and the British began to fight each other. Well, there's no way in the world with the French in a fight and the, and the Vietnamese in a fight that our country is going to support the Vietnamese. So through our diplomatic contacts in Europe, we swung around and we gave the French four billion dollars worth of aid to try to defeat Ho Chi Minh. And then using our arms and equipment, Ho Chi Minh beat them at the Nguyen Bien Phu, made prisoners of them, picked up what was left of their four billion dollars worth of stuff and kicked them out. See, it was a very complicated thing. But it had all been planned at the, at the Tehran Conference in 1943. Wasn't that also a function of uh, Roosevelt was very much anti-colonialist and... Well, that's from the 43 meeting. Yeah, that right. comes out of that. But that when he died, Truman really didn't have those feelings. Truman didn't sort of care <clears throat> one way yeah. or another. But the decision had been made so that uh, 
you know, I mean, with the other countries, too, and you couldn't change, you know, the, 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 like the British got out of India without raising hell. I mean, they, they, they got out, and they got out of uh, Burma, and, and we had a little trouble with getting the Dutch out of uh, Indonesia. But those decisions had been pretty well made, and the war had been fought, we thought, with that in mind, the war in Asia. You don't mean Truman made the decision, do you? you mean no, no, no. I mean in the in the in the Tehran conference. That's Roosevelt. See, the Tehran. Con a lot of people haven't studied the Tehran conference enough. It was Roosevelt, Churchill, Stalin, and Chiang Kai-shek. You can't find a single book that will say that Chiang Kai-shek was at the. I have one book that 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 says Chiang Kai-shek was at the Tehran conference. I was at the Tehran conference. I was the pilot that flew the Chinese there, so I know damn well they were there. I flew them there, <laughs> and I've. <laughs> Pardon? Tell us a bit about that. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's rather surprising because um, we had had the Cairo conference, which was Churchill, Roosevelt, and Chiang Kai-shek. And they did that on purpose to create Chiang Kai-shek as a fourth major leader, see? But there's a, a, a bad political problem there. Chiang's worst enemy was not the Japanese. He was a dictator. He ordinarily would have sided with the Japanese, see, but he, he was a dictator, but he was controlled by T.V. Sung. Uh, first of all, T.V. Sung's sister was his wife, and secondly, T.V. Sung was the wealthiest man in the world, so Chiang Kai-shek knew who he was working for. Well, this gave Stalin a problem, because if Stalin was going to try to agree with Roosevelt to, to, to help Chiang fight the Japanese so we can move B-29 bombers closer to Japan to bomb and end the war, Chang's enemy wasn't the Japanese. Chang was Mao Zedong. Well, Mao's a communist, and how the hell is Stalin going to going to tell them to you know to to, to to forget the communists and side with this guy Chang, who was a dictator, and he had a hell of a time. So Ro Roosevelt did it. He he argued with Stalin. Churchill kept quiet, and they finally worked out an agreement. It probably cost a hell of a lot of money, where Stalin told Mao, look. Chang is fighting to get rid of the Japanese, which is good for China, so, so be quiet for a while. Well, that was 43. Chang, uh, I mean, Mao beat Chiang Kai-shek in 49, so there was an interval. But what happened immediately, and it was noticeable, because I was based in Cairo, and, uh, and as I say, I, I had been at the Cairo conference, and then I flew uh, the Chinese up to Tehran from Cairo. These were T.V. Sung's delegates that had been there at the conference, and um, en route, just as a point of interest, I landed at uh, Habania in Iraq to get fuel, and another plane landed. It was Elliot Roosevelt he, and with a friend of mine, uh, Captain Gray. They were going up there. Elliot said his father wanted him to meet Stalin, and we stood and talked. I introduced him to the Chinese. It was no secret the Chinese were going up there, except to the newspapers. They never mentioned it, and the books don't mention it. Wasn't Elliot Roosevelt some kind of a covert operator in some way? Was it Elliot Roosevelt was, was based... Yeah, Kermit. Elliot Roosevelt, who is Roosevelt's son, Franklin D. Roosevelt's son, was based in Algiers with an uh, Air Force reconnaissance unit doing, doing recon work out of Algiers. But he, he was on his way, and, and the point is that if he saw the Chinese going up there, he'd know darn well they were there. His father knew they were there. And I don't know whether you know this interesting story or not, which Elliot Roosevelt wrote and signed himself that years later, <coughs> when he went back to Moscow to talk to Stalin as a sort of a reporter, as he was leaving, Stalin said, I'd like to ask you a... No, no, Elliot said, I'd like to ask you a question, sir. He said, why is it that when my mother, Eleanor Roosevelt, asked three different times for permission to go to Moscow, to visit Moscow, your ambassador turned her down? And Stalin acted surprised. He says, you don't know why we did that? He said, no. He said, well, he said, I sent my ambassador, Gromyko, down to Georgia when the president died, and I asked, have him ask Mrs. Roosevelt one thing. May I view the body? Because Roosevelt was in a coffin that was closed. It was never open. And Stalin had idea that he'd been poisoned, and therefore he would be black or discolored, and they couldn't see him. So he asked Gromyko to take a look at him. And he sent Gromyko back a second time. She gave him the same answer. Sent her back a third time, and no. 
So it said when she wanted to come to Moscow, we wouldn't let her. And Elliot said, well, why was it so important that Gromyko have to view the body? After all, uh, my father was dead. And Stalin said, you don't know why. And this is, this is Elliot Roosevelt writing and signing the story. He said, he was murdered. By whom? The Churchill gang. Just like that. And Elliot asked him again. He said, what was in it? Churchill gang. You don't know that? And, and, you know, poisoned. Well, I have known English people who think that's true. And just in conversation, they say, have you heard the story that, that uh, Roosevelt was killed by some people from here? But the interesting thing is, you know the Sunday supplement magazine called Parade? You know, 15 million every Sunday? Did you know that that story was printed in Parade in 1983 and signed by Elliot Roosevelt? And nobody seems to know that. 1983? 1983. I have a copy of it upstairs. No kidding. Do you think that's a true story? Oh, no, if Elliot signed it. Well, I mean, well, I, I, I understand that Stalin thought it was true. Do you think it was true? Well, I would have no way of knowing except I read the story. Okay. And I know this much, too, that, that Franklin D. Roosevelt had... To, I had ordered Elliot to be in Tehran to meet Stalin, you know. In other words, uh, that Elliot had met Stalin, so it's very, you know, uh, reasonable to expect that, that uh, the, the editor-in-chief of Look magazine would send him to Moscow because he knew Stalin. Nobody else could have a face-to-face -face con. I mean, those elements are pretty true, and I can't imagine Elliot writing it as a... Uh, you know, in 83, uh, the situation would be such that if it wasn't true, we'd have a hell of a time with everybody in the Soviet Union. Didn't you, meet, you met uh, Elliot on his way up to visit yeah. Stalin once when he was doing a, what, a gas drop for his plane or re refueling? Or? We, we stopped at uh, Iraq in, in uh, uh, Habania, was a British airport there, and got gas. And it was at that time that Elliot saw that the Chinese were on their way to Tehran because the next time we landed, we were in Tehran. And uh, I had all the Chinese with me. And what was interesting is we were, the, the, the uh, Russians were in charge of the protection of the city, the protection of the, of the people for the conference, which, which they should have learned, should have had them down there taking care of Dallas in 63. We, we, got to the, we got into the inner city of Tehran, and I had been there before, and all around the inner city of, of Tehran, and it's a big city, there was a velvet uh, like a rug about 12 feet high from a cable and you couldn't, you know, a wall, you could not get by that barrier. And it was just a curtain hanging there, a big velvet curtain all around the city. I, I walked about a third of it just to see if it kept going. But every 50 yards it was a, a, a Russian soldier carrying a weapon and half of them were female. They, they, they had females in the army and a lot of them, this was the kind of duty they'd be on. Well, when we were coming in from the airport, <clears throat> having arrived almost just one two with the British delegation that came with Churchill in his big York airplane and, and my plane landing, we were driving into the city and all of a sudden I couldn't go any closer, or the car I was in couldn't get any closer to this velvet curtain. We had to stop. And the Chinese that I had brought up there were, of course, in the, their VIP cars just ahead of us. We were just tagging along with them. And ahead of them was a delegation that couldn't get through the curtain, just stopped there. And for this kind of a thing, nobody wanted to accept the delay, but we had to. And then I saw the Chinese start laughing, and they were pointing, and they would stand up in the car, and they were pointing, and that sort of thing. And what it was is, is Churchill was in his... What they used to call that jumper, you know, jump for the suit. jumpsuit that they wore for the bombing attacks, you know, in London. He had his jumpsuit, had his typical cigar, and he had his uh, his derby on, you know, and he had no pockets in the jumpsuit, so he had no ID. And the Russian soldiers that were guarding that that curtain wouldn't let him in, you know, and everybody with him had ID, and they said, look, this is Mr. Churchill, the sword, where's his ID? And he had and the Chinese yeah, were just laughing to beat the, the, beat the man. Churchill must have thought they, they don't recognize me. Well, you know, it was it was a typical Russian soldier, you know, he is, where's your pass, and never mind what your face is, I mean, we all thought that, but they kept, they made him wait, we, we had to wait, and 
Finally, somebody from inside came out and rescued old Churchill and let him through the gate, and they shooting on through. And when we got to the gate, we were directed to where we were going to, weren't going to stay while we were visiting, but we weren't put it inside. But that, that just killed the Chinese. They were still in there laughing to beat the band. Do you think that the cold... I asked you earlier about the bankers in Russia and who, who controlled the money system in Russia. What I was leading to was if our money was backing the earliest Russians, and if our bankers were friendly with the earliest Russians, and if they were indeed financing them to some degree, was the Cold War a put-up job? Was, it, was there really ever a difference? Because if our bankers were running Russia's banks, and if they were running our banks, they would know better than to know, you know, that Russia would be against us to the degree that we were all told during the Cold War they were against us. Do you think that there was some kind of put-up job uh, well, on an enormous scale here? That, that I don't know whether, and, and I don't mean to be uh, t talking down to anybody, no. most of all present company, the Cold War started before the end of World War II. Uh, our OSS people made contact with what they considered to be valuable intelligence agents within the Russian sphere before the war ended, when the Russians were still our allies. And uh, they exfiltrated those people, uh, about 50-50, Nazis and pro-Nazis. And um, uh, Mr. Dulles, deputy Frank Wisner was stationed in Bucharest. Dulles was in Switzerland, was in Bucharest, Romania. And we had a lot of POWs, American air crews in Romania, that we'd been bombing the Ploesti oil field. A lot of planes were shot down because all low-level bombing. And so it was a, a humanitarian effort for uh, Wisner to try to find ways to get these POWs out. In the brief interval, by the time the Russian army was coming into Romania across that border, and the German army was fleeing out of Romania in the northwest border. So in that some two-week period, <clears throat> he put together a, a freight train, a big freight train, and he put 750 Americans on that freight train, POWs. And these Nazis that he was taking out, he stuck them in the freight train. So he got them out of there. Well, now, the object of the whole thing was viewing from their point of view, the OSS point of view, and they had British help in this, that the, the, the enemy in the future, the post-war future, was going to be communism. And so they bring these guys out, and the freight train went through the Balkans with the doors sealed, like any freight train, came out in Turkey, and as it entered Turkey, General Giles, who was a commanding general in, uh, in Cairo, head of the Middle East Command, called my boss at Cairo, and I happened to be chief pilot there. He said, have planes enough to go up there and pick these men up and bring them out when they get off the train. Because after the train goes through Turkey on this regular track that's there, it goes, because there were mountains, it goes into Syria for several miles. And it's only just a barely across the border, but it's in Syria. So my boss, a general named Smith, and I went up there the day before and reconnoitered the ground because no airfield. And we found a place we could operate from. And we talked to the British who were stationed there, and they said it was a pretty good deal. So we went up to, I went up and took 40 airplanes the next day and went up there, and we just landed and waited. And sure enough, here came the freight train, and it stopped. And the doors opened, and out came these guys just running across that place. And so I would fill one airplane and send them out, and the next plane, and the next plane. And I had the, the general's plane, which had... Uh, plush seats and all, and um, the last guys to come out, some of them had been injured, and we had nurses with us and all, got on my plane to go out, and I noticed that some other guys just standing in the aisle that, that, that were just kind of extra, because I wasn't on the other plane. I didn't realize there was so many of them, and they, they weren't uh, Americans, and uh, they were the, these uh, uh, Romanians and whatever from the Balkans, plus uh, Nazis that they had gotten to change over, you see, uh, like Galen did, the, the head of, of German intelligence, General Galen, changed, and, and he was picked up the same way, but he went out through uh, Germany. And I brought these fellows down to Cairo. Well, the minute they got to Cairo, there were cars there to whisk them off, and we never saw them again. But that's uh, evidence of the beginning of the Cold War, because that was in September of 44, 
and the German surrender came in May of 45. Well, well, I guess what I was getting at was, was the Cold War a truly a real thing? Because, in other words, if our <laughs> bankers are running the banks in Russia, was the Cold War an honest cover, <coughs> or was it something mm -hmm. where it was just done to sort of t suck money out of the American people and the Russian people and put a bogeyman, you know, that we were the bogeyman for the Russians, am I right? And they were the bogeyman for us. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there was any If you to... read um, Buckminster Fuller's enormously important book called Critical Path, a computer term, Critical Path, he states very clearly that the so-called Cold War created expenditures, and, and he died in 83, so he's talking about 45 to 83, of over $6 trillion. Now, if $6 trillion had not changed hands and then multiplied as it changed between 45 and 83, uh, there would have been, our business world would have been a lot different than it was, including the Soviet's business world and the British and everybody else. Uh, or, as the book I quote so often, the uh, uh, Leonard Lewin's book, The Report from Iron Mountain, our governments do not know how to operate without the threat of war. They, they just, they just, and, and, and he says that Kennedy started a commission of people to study what we had to do to run a nation in a time of permanent peace, when you could just say you don't need a defense department. He said, you know, how are you going to do it? No question about it. You know, and that's astounding when you realize that that kind of information has been floating around uh, in the government and in the public for my goodness, years. Well, didn't it come up at the recent conference? In fact, didn't the Bay of Pigs was really meant to fail and that it was meant to sort of engage Kennedy in a, in a larger... Uh, he was put in a, in a fait accompli where he had to invade Cuba. Was, was that brought up? No, that wouldn't have been me. Okay. No, because... You agree with that? No, you? no. I don't think they ever really intended to do away with Castro. Castro's convenient, just like Khrushchev was convenient. Stalin was convenient, when you think about it. No, it's a different play of the game, because if Castro was a problem, we get rid of him. I mean, what, what did we do with Quirino? We gave Lansdale a blank checkbook, and we got rid of Quirino. No problem. Uh, they weren't happy with uh, no Dindium and his brother. Somehow or other, they got killed. I mean, what are we talking about here? Uh, Castro, 90 miles away, we can't find out how to take the air out of his tires? You so know. what do you think is his strategic uh, purpose? Or why do you think we haven't taken Castro out? I mean, we're no great, though, no real necessity. Well, we act as though he's such a menace and such well, a problem. Uh, you got to have a problem. See, you got to have a problem. You can't govern a nation without the threat of war. <laughs> and they always say Castro was going to be the base for the missiles, you know. It was always very convenient to say that 90 miles away, my God, he can fire any old missiles ever built 90 so miles away. You have to worry all the time. To, sure. And, oh, okay. and uh, yeah. Okay. And yet, why does Castro leave Guantanamo on his, uh, oh, wow. uh, yeah, see? But it, th it sounds like a very serious business, and then when you think about it carefully, it sounds very childish. The, the, the script for this movie isn't much good. It's got no chance of getting an Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever written a screenplay? Have you ever thought of making a film and dramatizing uh, some of the things you know? I write so much anyway and uh, read so much that, uh, uh, what do they say? I've always got something on my plate. <laughs> I've, I've thought of them. In fact, Right now, it's a question of whether I should start in on my autobiography because I have a kind of a strange personal feeling that if I don't write it down, it, 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 just like talking with you people, whom I figure are quite well informed, much better than average, and yet there are so many things we talk about that, that you, you haven't heard of that I, I keep thinking, you know, I should set this down. And it's not just for these subjects. Uh, uh, I, I got involved. 
and I don't know how this started. I was a, a branch manager of the bank in the Pentagon. Well, it happens to be the biggest bank in the whole Washington area in terms of people. You know, in the, in the Pentagon, I got 35,000 people sitting on your shoulders, all wanting to cash their paychecks. So that's a, that's a, but anyway, I happen to be branch manager. So the, the people, the directors of the bank thought it'd be a good idea to take that old stupid Air Force colonel and send him to school. So they sent me to the to the American Bankers Association Graduate School of Banking at Madison, Wisconsin, and I, I graduated from there. Well, while I was there, I met a young man who was from the American Bankers Association and was in charge of the computerization programs for banks, which at those days was in the future. I mean, they all still scribble little notes and put them in big bins and kept records that way. But the computer world was coming up, see? Well, he found out, this man at the Wisconsin school, that because I had been in the military, I'm very familiar with computers. I was the first person to put an entire Air Force command, 77,000 people, and all their records on a computer back in 1951, I guess, something like that. And he thought, hey, can you do that with banks? You know, oh, well, just buy the computers, <laughs> cinch. So the American Bankers Association created an organization called the uh, Committee on Automation, Planning, and Technology. And although I came from a, a very small bank on a relatively basis, I was a charter member of that committee. And I worked with them for a couple of years converting the banking system to computers. And that meant creating this horrible thing we call credit cards. And after we got the banks in, we all got thinking, yeah, but what about the, 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 the Federal Reserve System? Why aren't they in this? So I was hired to be a consultant to a firm out here that, that has made its reputation and its money on uh, ticket sales for airlines, you know, there reservations for airlines uh, called AirRink, and they're, they're computer experts. And, and on a, considering the years we're talking about back in the mid-60s, they were a real fine. So the Federal Reserve System got a contract with AirRink, and AirRink hired me as a consultant, and we put the Federal Reserve System on computers. Well, I only cite that because, again, I never dreamed of either working for a bank, going to the school, working in computers, and putting the... I, I kind of feel bad I put the Federal Reserve on computers. <laughs> it would have been better the way it was. <laughs> but, you know, to recapitulate the era and to try to explain it the way it went for those of us involved, I, I feel a certain responsibility that I should do that. But it sounds kind of funny to throw that on top of the Bay of Pigs or the U-2 or some other things, you know, they don't seem to fit, but that's exactly how they happened, you see. And then while I was in the bank, we tried to get new accounts. And I read in a paper about the Congress being so bold as to start an organization called Amtrak. Well, at that time, it wasn't called Amtrak. They, they invented the name later, but, you know, Amtrak, the rail, passenger railroad. And I thought, my God, there'd be nothing better than to get a passenger railroad system going. And they're going to have a lot of money. There's, there's all this, uh, they got to fund it. So I went to a man on the board, what do you call it, the uh, organizing board of this new company, and asked where they were going to keep their funds and everything. Would he put them in the bank in the Pentagon? You know, we could take care of them. And uh, we got talking, and he said, hey, he said, we got a bigger problem than that. The minute we open, we have to have offices all over the United States so that this railroad system can do business with the government and with the military. We want, we want a director to handle government and military sales for the railroad. Why don't you do that and hell with the bank? I said, you know, it sounds good, you know. So I joined him, and I toyed with the trains for 10 years. Well, now, I never dreamed of doing that either. And yet, in the process, <clears throat> I had a very unusual career there. I became the, the president of the corporation, three different presidents, uh, speechwriter for six years. I wrote all the speeches, all the things, all the public word for Amtrak. I happened to be the writer. Well, I've always felt that if you're a writer, you have to know something. So I started reading railroad books and meeting railroad people, and I was absolutely stunned to find out how little Railroad people knew about railroads. They just figure you buy a few trains and a locomotive and send it down the track. And, and really, it's about that, you know. <clears throat> so I went to England and France and Japan. The president of the Japanese Railroad invited me over there. and I went all up and down that beautiful system they have. And I began to know about railroads. So one day, the McGraw-Hill Scientific Encyclopedia called me up. 
And they said, listen, we have to have a section on, on railroad engineering in our encyclopedia. And I said, well, I'm not an engineer. Yeah, but we can't find any railroad engineers. You write it. So I did. Well, I had written a book for the Air Force on aeronautics. I thought I could write a railroad book. I did. It's strange to fall into those different things, but in a, in a way they're related. You try to take existing facts and relate them to the public. And I could apparently do that, whether it was a speech for the president of Amtrak or the article for the, for the scientific encyclopedia. And what happens when you spend a life in that kind of thing is you begin to get seriously concerned about the degradation of the infrastructure of, the, of this country. It shouldn't be like it is. Uh, we've got $42 billion worth of bridges in this country that have been condemned and need repair because the railroads no longer carry the heavy freight. It's on trucks, and the trucks are heavier than the bridges were built. They couldn't visualize these big trucks when they built those bridges 40, 50 years ago or 100 years ago. And there's many cities and towns that can't be served by trucks with a full load. The railroads don't go there anymore. Railroads used to go to 45,000 communities. Now they only go to 13,000. And wheat growing in Nebraska is piled up in the streets in some of the towns, and neither trucks nor trains can come get it, so it rots. Now that's a fine state of affairs for the, quote, greatest nation in the world. We're in bad shape. But you don't get to the point where you can support that statement until you've seen it like the failure of the Bay of Pigs or the stupid flight of the U-2 or what goes on in the railroads. They're interrelated, really. It's the fact that so much in this country today has deteriorated, is on the brink of deterioration, that, that really we have become the most dependent society ever created in mankind. We wouldn't know where to get a red apple on a tree if we had to do it ourselves. We wouldn't know, do you know where the bread you eat is baked? Have you got the slightest idea? In Washington, 90% of our bread is baked up in Pennsylvania. So without trucks, we wouldn't have it. That making is what the label on the bread says. It's all a great monster big thing up there. I went to the the Culinary Institute of America up on the Hudson River. It's where they teach chefs how to be great chefs. It's a wonderful place. It takes months to get a reservation to go there for dinner. Well, we stopped there one time, and I, they served dinner, and I had these wonderful muffins. And the, the waiters that, that just stand all around are the students because they did the cooking. They want to know what you think of what they... You don't need a menu. They just put all this stuff on your table. <laughs> so I picked the muffin up, and I turned to one of the students, and I said, where do you get the wheat for, for this muffin? It's wonderful. So we just buy it. No, no, you don't. Where do you get it? Well, I'll find out. So he ran through the room into the to chef. And others gathered around the table. There were 10 or 15 of these students, all to see what the question about the muffin was. And so while they were standing there, I said, you know what they're gonna, he's going to tell me? When he comes back, he's going to say they get it in Canada because American wheat isn't edible. This is, this is an edible biscuit. This is good. He came back, and he was smiling. He said, you're right. We don't buy it here. We buy it in Canada. Now that's quite a statement. It is the Culinary Institute of America, the, the top chef organization in this country. And to get proper food on our tables, at least on their table, they go to Canada. <clears throat> How many people realize that? Nobody does. Well, it, it, we, we already don't get bananas here. We already don't get you know a lot of things here. What are we going to do? When all of a sudden, like these cities and towns and some of the outlying areas and the trucks can't get there, what are we going to do for food or shoes? <laughs> really, this country has got to get itself organized and create an infrastructure that it used to be best in the world, relatively speaking, from that age, and put us today best in the world with the things that we know. Why, why do we still have an electric light system as antiquated as we have? And, and so on. You know, it, there's no reason in the world we should be operating like this. What do you think the reason is? Um, the ability of power centers to control the federal government, the rest of the governments don't matter anymore, see? And that can be done so easy with money. 
I mean, this fellow North running for senator here has already spent $11 million, I understand, just to get some votes to be senator. Well, you know, he may be the right guy for senator, but my point is that just throwing money around, you know, is the way the power centers get their will done. And, of course, we all know they throw money all over the Congress all the time. And so things are done that way, and these power centers aren't necessarily... They're interested in what they produce, not in what we need. And it's, it's, a, it's really difficult. It's not going to be easy to straighten this out. It's going to be a disaster. It's a matter of uh, the people getting, taking a little more power for themselves. Like, uh... <clears throat> well, and first of all, getting more education, because right now they don't realize it. I mean, I don't, again, mean to speak to you or anyone else that may see what we're doing as, as though you didn't know what's going on, but think of how many things we've talked about that you haven't heard about before, sure. and yet I'm citing books that are as open and available as, as, as a telephone book, you know, and yet we don't know. Our media, you know, without, the Jefferson said, without media, there's no sense of having the government because people won't know what to do. That's exactly what we're doing. Our media does not provide us with the most important things every day. Didn't Jefferson say that if it was a choice between government or media, he''d rather have media? Yeah, because without it, you don't have government. You, knowledge, you see, yeah. expect the media. And the media today, they defend what is written. That's not what I'm concerned about. I'm just concerned about what they don't write. See, the omissions, that's what COPA's about. We want, COPA wants to know what's not there, see, not what is there. Right. Now, they may not know everything that is there either, but that's not, they want to know what isn't there. And a lot of what isn't there is already published, but, but it can't be made available to the public. And one thing is, you, have, you can't just blame the media, is you look at the figures today on how many hours each one of us spends in front of the t TV set and what's coming over the TV set, you know, uh, and that, that's um, amazing. I don't know how to turn my TV set on. I never turn it on. Because, you know, it's got a cable thing up there. I've never used it. I mean, but how many people, I mean, I just don't, I'd be darned if I'm going to sit there and watch that stuff when I could be reading a good book or doing some writing or something like that or sleeping, you know. Hey, so Fletch, um, you know, you've lived a pretty full life. And what are some of the real highlights back in the in the times where, you know, you felt a jump in, in your own consciousness too, you know, whether it be in the Tehran conferences or experiencing some of the early stuff when you're in infantry cavalrymen or, or in Tokyo airport knowing that the arms are going to, you know, Korea and Vietnam. What are some of the real highlights or some just some fun stories or some details? Well, I'll tell you, things that influenced me, and again, uh, not exactly by selection, is even when I was a, a young man, uh, the Depression was the big thing in our lives. And um, I was not quite 12 years old, and in my city, you couldn't get a license to deliver papers. You know, uh, you couldn't use children to do work, the theory. So I, and I was offered a, a paper route by another fellow, to, and I could earn a few pennies, you see. So he had to wait for a couple of months till I became 12, and then I got the paper route. And with that, I began to have my own money in my pocket, and, and uh, it was very, very small. But I, be, I, I saw that if I increased the size of the paper route, I'd increase the income. And believe it or not, during the Depression, my father, as a city administrator, had 900 men working for him in his department. <clears throat> and of course, he was getting paid more than they were. And I had such a large paper route, I was making more money each week than he was. Okay. Uh, uh, the economics, you see, work by the system you're manipulating. And I learned then, as a teenager, that you can create the income you have to have, or you can create the thing. Well, in the, in the middle of that, it was customary in my neighborhood for people to belong to a, a scout troop. And so I joined the scouts in between delivering papers. And one fall, the scouts, in order to raise a little extra money, decided to put on a minstrel show. Remember the old deal when there's a Mr. interlocutor and the end men and the chorus in the back and a very ritualized thing. But it was an annual affair, and they had it in the basement of this beautiful church up there. And, and uh, 
as a paper boy, I couldn't become involved in all the rehearsals and everything, but I was in the troupe, and I used to go there and hear the guys rehearsing, and they'd be working, and I'd go out and peddle my papers. And the night before the show was going on, the director came to the troupe and said, fellas, so-and-so, Clifford something, is sick, and he had the lead song to sing. He said, i got to have somebody else sing it. So he get up, and the next guy, and the next guy. And either because he was tired of something, and when he got to me, he said, you're going to do it. And I'd never done anything like that in my life, although I liked to sing. I could play the piano, and I'd sing at home. So I sang that night, and my God, I got encores, which no one else in the minstrel show had gotten. So the man that was running the minstrel shows was not a member of the troupe. He was a man that put on the minstrel shows, so there would be a bit of professionalism to the work. And he came to me and he said, hey, I got a minstrel show next week. I need another tenor. Would, would you do the same song for this other group? Well, okay. And he paid me $2 or something like that. Fine. You make money by singing. This is new. <laughs> next thing I know, in the old days, and I don't know how many people remember this, when they had horse races and before TV days, the horses would race, and then on the radio, there would be this three or four minute interval, and they would read how the race came out, and a few notes, everything that came by telephone to the studio. And then until the next race, they'd have a piano player or something. And one day I was walking from high school down to get the bus to go home, and this piano player, who knew me a little from my singing, said, hey, come up in the studio. So I went up, and he said, hey, here's, you know this music? I said, sure, sing. So I'm on the radio. And I broadcast six or eight weeks that way. Again, total surprise, and running home to deliver my papers every night because I needed that income, and the radio didn't pay me anything. And a man, man called me up, and he said, uh, I'm the manager of an orchestra. And in those days, that meant a big band. And he said, we need, we, we need a male singer. We need, we'd like to have a tenor, and I heard you on the radio. Would you come? So I went to rehearsal. So the next weekend, I'm hired to sing with this big band orchestra. We played all over the Northeast, everywhere from Boston to New York and all around. And the beautiful thing about it was, instead of having to run all over the neighborhood delivering papers, I could get a $20 bill just for singing a few songs. Well, that was monstrous in those days. So, you know, these things overtook me. Uh, I, I knew I could sing a song, but I didn't know I could sing it the way an audience would like to hear it. And that led to so many things. I sung in cathedrals all over the Northeast. I began to make more money with it. I bought a car, I paid my own way through school, all that sort of thing, just from something that was so easy to do. Well, then, all of a sudden, to change that, <clears throat> when I graduated from college, rolled up in my diploma were my orders to active duty. I had been in ROTC, so I had a, a, and also my second lieutenant commission. And it said, be it. Fort um, uh, <laughs> Fort Drum, they call it today, but uh, Pine Camp, New York, uh, 4th Armored Division on the 10th of July. Well, it was the middle of June then, so I just had a month to prepare to go in the military, and I was in the military for 24 years. But even then, funny things, interesting things happened. The first man I reported to, I drove on the base, totally lost. In those days, the military bases, this was one that had just been opened, and you'd hardly know it was a military base. It looked like an old Boy Scout camp that had been run down, and they were still building the buildings that we lived in. The first man I reported to duty uh, to was a Captain Creighton W. Abrams. Abrams later was Chief of Staff of the Army. He was the Chief of our Forces in Vietnam. He was from my hometown. We were old buddies. And here I meet him just, you know, luck of the draw. So I worked in, in the Armored Regiment and uh, in the tank outfit for a while, long enough to know about him. And most people may not realize that this was before Pearl Harbor, this was in July of 41, our 4th Armored Division was totally equipped with skis, parkers, ski boots, fur thing, big mittens. Our division was slated to go into the Army, before Pearl Harbor, to go into the war in Russia. We were going to land in Murmansk and come down from the northern area because the idea was we were going to help Russia with against Germany directly. Now, otherwise, we wouldn't have had 14,000 men with skis and with these enormous, I mean, we were just loaded with stuff, and this was summertime. We could put it in boxes and keep it because we'd be traveling sometime that fall. Well, at about that time, 
I had already obtained in civilian life a, a, a pilot's license. And I got orders one day from the Army, and it said, because you have a pilot's license, you will report to Maxwell Air Force Base for, for military pilot training. You're going into the Air Force. So that got me in the Air Force. Bingo. I left my skis up there in New York. <laughs> well, I don't know how long this could go, but it, it, it has surprised me in recapitulation to see that events like that, that had so much to play in my lifetime happened without me even knowing it. I just opened the orders and there they are. I was at Fort Knox, Kentucky on Pearl Harbor Day. Well, in those days, Fort Knox had gold in the, in the big gold thing down there, great huge array of buildings with deep cellars. We'd go down there and see the darn stuff full of gold. And of course, <laughs> the immediate thought of our commanding general when he heard about Pearl Harbor was guard that gold. And every live man on <laughs> Fort Knox was out there with a gun guarding the gold from the Japanese or somebody, I don't know, the squirrels. And, <laughs> and another man that was there whom I got to know fairly well was George Patton, General Patton. And uh, uh, then from there, <clears throat> uh, I went into this flying school. And in flying school, uh, I got out and again, headed. The, I was at the Presque Isle, Maine, the most northern base in the whole United States, at least at that time. And again, we were going to fly North Atlantic. The, the uh, government was still set on this business of having a lot of us go into the north. And at that time, I was all, because I had already been an officer, I was a first lieutenant, and most of the other new lieutenants up there were, were second lieutenant. So I got a phone call from the Pentagon one day, and it said, uh, you've got 52 lieutenants up there. All of you have been ordered to a new, new assignment. You head right now from where you are to Palm Beach, Florida, for further orders. We all ended up in Africa. We trained for the north and everything else, but we ended up in Africa. And immediately, we're up in North Africa supporting uh, the, the desert troops behind um, General Montgomery and General Alexander chasing Rommel out of North Africa. Well, I could keep going like that, but I just never realized that, that, you know, when it was happening, that it happened with unbroken string. I never had a day off. <laughs> you know, it just kept going. Did you ever know Stillwell? No, because he was in China. Right. And I was the chief pilot in Cairo with 1,200 pilots. We had a heck of an outfit. I have 405 airplanes that are based in Cairo, the big airline. And our planes would go as far as the CBI, but we would stop at the uh, Assam Valley, and the other way we'd go to Casablanca. So I never went into China at that time. I went later, but uh, no, I didn't know Stillwell. Because he has such a wonderful reputation as, as being a smart, tough man. Yeah. I remember he used to call the uh, used to call Chiang Kai-shek the little peanut. Yeah. Well, he, he was right. He was he wasn't wrong. <laughs> and you know, an outgrowth of this question about Chiang Kai-shek that is interesting today is when. It came time to press the Japanese through Burma. The British needed additional forces, and we didn't have enough forces out there. We had uh, what we call Merrill's Marauders, that, that crowd, but that, you know, com commandos more or less. But we needed men, we needed a lot. So Chiang Kai shek sent a division down to Burma, and we made a single force out of some British, some Americans, and the Chinese. Well, the Americans, as is typical, were the paymasters of the whole force. And the way they used to do it in those days was, was pay was always cash on the table. No checks, no, no credit cards, all that. And the finance officer would come by airplane with these boxes they call footlockers, you know, about so big, uh, like a trunk. And it'd just be loaded with, with dollar bills, just loaded. So being in the transport business, I had to fly the finance officers many, many times. And the finance officers go into Burma, and this will interest you, you open their box and no dollar bills, little white like sugar packages, opium. The Chinese troops are paid by opium. But this is American finance officer. So we used to sit there and say, now where the hell do those guys, where do they get it? See, where does it come from? We had a supply of opium funneling through Burma into Southeast Asia during World War II, which by Vietnam time had become professional. And General Lee Mi, the old uh, Chinese general that was defeated in 49 when Chiang was defeated, moved his division into northern Burma 
and picked up the trade in the Golden Triangle, well, he was just had the same troops and moved them over into Laos where they had the, the Miang tribesmen. Well, the, the, they were southern Chinese. They're not Laotians, but there were 65,000 of them in Laos under the command of CIA, by the way, and ostensibly to fight Viet, the Viet Minh troops coming through from, from uh, Hanoi, which makes an interesting little story, but these were all the male tribesmen. And what are they doing up there? Growing poppies. And this whole thing swept into Southeast Asia. <clears throat> and then by the time all that gets organized, the military paying in, in, uh, in, in uh, heroin anyway, in opium anyway, uh, General Lee Mi growing the opium, the, the Mayo tribesmen growing the opium, and the Vietnam War coming in. Then the guys from Marseille moved in and took over the operation. And, and people don't realize that it all had antecedent. There was no holiday. The, 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 the Japanese signed the, the surrender in Tokyo Bay on September 2nd, 45. Ho Chi Minh declared the independence of Vietnam on September 45. Our army general, a fellow named Gallagher, was standing beside him on one side. On the other side was the OSS man, Lu Conin. Both are big names in the, the, the Vietnam business. And they start moving on into Vietnam. And we stayed there for 30 years getting the opium business organized. And people wonder where the where the drugs come from. You know. Can you, you know, it's such an important subject because, especially with the amount of propaganda that came over with, with uh, Bush and Reagan coming in and Bush and Reagan putting Bush as drugs are and making huge amounts of money and sending huge boats to Panama. Uh, and my generation and, and, and uh, getting flooded with cocaine, and let alone in the Afro-American uh, population getting flooded with heroin and poor whites. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, so, it's so bad that they would, not only does it dis disorient and keep people down, but then they, they use the profits. Mm -hmm. And if we can go on to that just a little bit, because it's it's really, really, you know, a huge job on the American people, a huge snow job, not to make any puns. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's really important because the generations and the people just don't know the details. No. Well, they don't. And unfortunately, <clears throat> it I think, again, it works from both ends. The, the people, the everyday guys, you know, you and me, don't ask the right questions, don't appear to be interested, and if some poor guy's all mixed up in drugs, we kind of ignore him, forget about it, like it'll go away, and that kind of thing, whereas it's the heart of things. But when you can find the antecedents, like how surprised we were in, in 44 to find this drug traffic, but, you know, legitimate, we've got to pay the Chinese division, you know, that's what, that's what the East India Company started. When, as I told you about Parafit's book, when the emperor would have nothing to do with the British, the East India Company just decided to, to move into China by distributing heroin from India, which was available. And they got in that way. Well, that's the way we're doing with the government today. You see, we're using the, the drugs to do it. And it's, it's, an old, it's an old system. It didn't just start in 44. And the, <clears throat> even in the Caribbean, uh, they talk about having all these oil wells, d drilling deep for oil in the Caribbean, where well, they all have helicopter pads. Well, the flight from a helicopter pad to the coast is not checked by customs. So you can bring all the helium you want, I mean, all the heroin you want in, there's no customs. They come, the oil men, just oil men coming back, you know, and so in they come. But even worse, when I was with the Air Defense Command, another one of these things that just starts, after I'd been in the ROTC program and had written the textbooks for ROTC in the 49 or 50, at Christmas time, the only time I've ever been ordered to travel at Christmas time in the military, I was ordered to go to Colorado Springs to open up the Air Defense Command, to begin it. Five of us were. <clears throat> so I left my family in Long Island where they lived, and I drove out. And we had a meeting with the mayor of Colorado Springs the minute we arrived. And he said, you know, you can't imagine how important the timing of this is. He said, this city was going to meet this week to decide what a city does when it's bankrupt. And Colorado Springs were bankrupt. He said, but now you guys are coming in here with a whole command, and we got no problem. How many houses do you want to rent to, you know, the, tomorrow, and how much of this? And we just opened it up. Well, I was in with that original group when the Air Defense Command started, and I stayed with them until they sent me over the Korean War. But what's important is that as we set up that Air Defense Command, 
We knew where 47,000 aircraft were on average all day, every day, meaning that any airplane coming up from the Caribbean or from Canada or from the Pacific was known because the radar makes no exceptions. They're all, it's just like turn a light on, it shines in all directions. And we knew airplanes were coming up from the Caribbean, but they would be given some kind of a pass, you know, don't touch them. When I was running the clandestine business, when, when Helms wanted to fly a uh, plane into Cuba some night, I'd have to call up the Air Defense Command, and I had a control officer there, and I'd say, listen, tonight, don't want to leave that flight alone. And it, I mean, if I didn't, they'd know he was going. And if they didn't have some reason to let him go, they'd, they'd stop it. You know, they'd, they'd, they'd catch a guy or shoot him down or the other. I mean, we have the capability of stopping everything that comes across our borders. But you take Mena, Arkansas. Planes are running in and out of Mena, Arkansas, like LaGuardia Field. Nobody touches them. Well, it's our own fault. The Air Defense Command lets them come in. Who, tell, who tells them to let them come in? I don't know who's there today. But Well, Clinton said that they asked Clinton this a few years ago when he was governor. Yeah, they said, they said, that they said, why are you why letting you, this, these why? operations continue? You're the governor. He said, this is a federal operation. Mm. I have nothing to say about no. it. No, yeah. Well, that's the way it does. Everybody's somebody else's problem, but um, and I'm sure the Air Defense Command will will announce that they're that it's not their problem. You know, things are so important in a Canada border that we're watching the Canada border. But all the stuff's built into the ground. You know, and it's there, and that was back in my day, 51, 52. No telling what it is today. The equipment is so much better and all that sort of that it is so satellite work reconnaissance work is so good that if you drove your car into your driveway and then took your bag out and put it in the back of the car while you put the thing down and the satellite went by, it'd see the bag in the back of your car without any trouble at all. Well, you mean, there's nothing it doesn't see. At the uh, Washington Sheraton the last few days of the COPA meeting, in the same part of the hotel, we saw a group of fellows called the Association of Old Crows. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And... Uh, we were all very curious. There was a crow with lightning bolt coming coming out of their feet. And yeah. It was electronic intelligence uh, warfare. Electronic well, warfare but intelligence that's the old crows go back to World War II and even before. They're the old Signal Corps, wow. and you know the Signal Corps is the original part of the army. Well, they, my dad they're was the they're very the proud of this old crows thing. When we first went to Africa, you know, we, we had to have navigation things, uh, beepers up there, radio, what we call radio ranges. And boy, those guys had them in there. Oh, we'd have been lost. We didn't know where to go. Yeah, the old crows, their, their headquarters is down here in Alexandria. Uh, but they do a lot of other things today. You know, it's just like the Air Defense Command. They do a lot of other things today. But it's, it's, it's unbelievable the way... All of these things seem to have the, the same problem. You know, it's a, there's a, there is a weakness or an illness within the structure, and if we don't hurry up and and describe it and recognize it, it the thing's going to fall down. See, it's like I say, even a pyramid can collapse if all you do is take care of the top, and that's what we're doing with our government. We, we funnel all our money to the top. They do. They, they spend. What is it? Twelve billion or seventeen billion on the U-2 plane, one plane, one bomber. Uh, I mean, on its development, it hasn't been certified yet. The son of a gun still can't go through the basic certification program. B2, you mean? The B-2. The, the B-2. B-2, yeah. Yeah. We uh, we're presently working right now with a B-2 whistleblower. The, with a B-2 what? A whistleblower. Oh yeah. And uh, she was working on the. Um, she was working for Hughes, and uh, she she was in charge of the accounting. And she noticed that uh, it was a cost plus account and that they were siphoning money off the mm. B2 radar and putting it to, uh, to other accounts mm. and they were having the audacity to call the other accounts wannabe radar, mm. joker radar, and she's in a suit right now with Hughes and they've already offered her between that and Lockheed $15 million to shut up. <laughs> and so we, we put in an uh, application with the Stuart Mott Fund for Constitutional Government to uh, to get a uh, journalism grant mm. to hire a couple of guys that I know to write a big story. We're going to fl fly this woman to Congress, to Conyers' office, because Conyers hates the B-2, and we're going to team Conyers up with this woman, yeah. speak in front of Congress, expose them, <coughs> and, uh, I mean, not that it's not that it's going to mm. change the world, but uh, a little bit helps. Yeah, well, that's that's prevalent today. Ernie Fitzgerald, an old buddy of mine. I've been talking to Ernie yeah. all about this. Ernie's yeah, yeah. the one that we put the application in. Yeah, well, and you know that 
the did he tell you about the C-17, the, no. the the airlift plane? It it was flying the other. You know, it won't fly unless they have a, a seven thousand pound load of concrete in the nose of the plane to keep the nose down because the wing is on wrong. Oh no! And and it flies regularly with a seven thousand pound load, and yet the whole airplane is designed to be as light as possible. You know, they, they all airplanes are. They put titanium instead of steel to make them lighter, and it's got seven thousand pounds of concrete. Well, the other day during some tests, it spun out. And it came down, and at 1,500 feet, the pilot finally got control of it before it crashed. I mean, that would have been the biggest crash we ever had. It's a huge, but that damn plane's no good. And and you see, what you're talking about is what happens. A plane like that, if I'm if I'm not wrong, that plane was being designed when I was still on duty, and I I retired 31 years ago. And they just still keep putting the money in. We're going to build a good airplane. By God, it'll be every year. I mean. But see, Congress can't handle that kind of stuff. They don't understand the technology. That's what I mean about going to the federal government. It can't, it can't buy airplanes. It doesn't know what the hell's going on. <clears throat> no, it, it's, it isn't a simple problem. And when you've cut through several areas the way I just happened to, um, it's, it becomes unbelievable. You, you, you just, like, I never thought, I, I always thought, you know, when I was teaching at Yale, I kept looking for a history book that would talk about the Tehran Conference. And I always found there's almost nothing uh, in there that was highly classified. It's not been, and, uh, but it never said the Chinaman was there. And I, you know, here's an open subject, important subject, had all that post-war planning in it uh, for the Far East, it's, it's Korea and Vietnam and all that. It didn't come out in a book anywhere. And it wasn't because it wasn't known. My God, those of us that saw these guys were talking about them. And the Chinese must have known. <laughs> You know, it, it, it's strange how things can can be so controlled. So the Chinese were helping to helping to and would benefit from the Korea and Vietnam Wars. Well, their goal, of course, being uh, uh, TV Sung's people, was to keep Chang in power and and to run you know to run China as a dictatorship would, which of course China had always been run and it runs better that way. But um, uh, what well, we needed them for was, or what Roosevelt used them for was to break down the old uh, European colonialism system, and that, that was on. That was what they were discussing. Uh, they made the deal with Stalin about the invasion. That was done, and he he told Mao to to quit fighting Chang, and Mao agreed. And in a in a surprising statement, one week precisely after the invasion of Normandy. Mao Zedong came out praising the invading forces for uh, helping their friends, the Russians, and by attacking the Germans from the Western Front. Well, all set up. See, I mean, it was all just like starting a ball going down the hill. <coughs> not, not to return back to the drugs for a sec, but there was this uh, rumor that was, uh, you know, eight, ten years ago that. When Bush was involved, and you know, was, Bush is a longtime CIA boy, and but have you, one of the operations when he was working in the oil, in Zapata Oil, was that he was using the offshore platforms, like you said. You know, it was rumored that yep. his offshore platforms were used for the drugs because of his intelligence. Yeah, and they were Zapata, and the same name as the Bay of Pigs. Called Zapata, like yeah. the Bay of Pigs. So the name filtered through without raising any eyebrows. People thought they were talking about Zapata, and they were, but it was Zapata oil instead of Zapata the, the invasion. And so, uh, do, you, do you know anything about this? I know you said that, you know, you looked and you saw the heroin in the trunks and, and certain things, but, um, you know, it's sort of the same old, same old for people that know what's going on. For mm. people that don't know what's going on, when they hear that George Bush might be involved in, in the cocaine traffic, even after the Panama incident, Mm. It's still it's still hard to believe because what a better cover story than to be the drug czar get win the new drug war? What a better cover story yeah. than to yeah. go the antithesis of what you're trying to do? Yeah. Well, as you can see, I I on purpose try to stick to things that I myself participated in, or like I tell you, I knew the Dulles brothers. So when I talk about the Dulles brothers, I talk how I knew them. I don't talk about when they were someplace else. Mm. And I find that there's so much to do with that, and I can just say, look, this is 
what I mean, we were in the same room. Here are the papers we used that I try to stay with that because the validity of the subject then becomes more important. To extrapolate one or two things away, now Bush was at Yale when I was teaching there, okay, but I don't think he was running. But he, he, was, he was in that, uh, the, the Skull and Bones outfit, and that separated him from the other Yale. Well, of course, all, all the professors knew about Skull and Bones. And uh, so you can extrapolate some. He's just been brought, brought up in that kind of living. Um, his his first oil job in Midland, Texas, where you know he sure. the old story of his red po red Pontiac, was it? He drove down there, for graduation present. He showed up in Midland Oil, and he meets uh, the guy that that runs. Uh, Pennzoil. Yeah, from Lidke. Yeah. Lidke. Lidke with Pennzoil, and then all yeah. of a sudden, when Bush is in the office here, and when Bush comes in the in the White House, then uh, the biggest business deal in history goes yeah. down with uh, Lidke. Lid Lidke make, gets the biggest settlement ever. It's the biggest yeah. settlement ever against Texaco. Well, that's just the old skull and bones boys keeping together. <laughs> but you know, a lot of things work that way so well. Is the old coalitions of families inevitably uh, stay with? And since nobody does anything about it, they go right ahead and do what they want. Sure. Like Jeb's running and. And Neil's running, and mm, yeah. you know it's. Uh, yeah, the Bush boys are both running for political office, yeah. and Oliver North is running at the same time. Yeah. Uh, I just heard Perot say that uh, he thinks uh, we ought to give the Republicans a chance and <laughs> and see how they do. If, well. if they embarrass themselves, then this is more of a reason to have a third party. Well, you know, and and there were such obvious things. Let's say we're driving down the road out here, and as a Marine driving his car home. And on the way, he, he uh, stops at a store on the side of the road to buy something, and he doesn't happen to have the money, so he steals what he wants and goes home. He's not supposed to be tried by the civil police. He's supposed to be tried by the military police. North should have been the first day they had a problem with him. The Marines should have called him back and court-martialed him within the Marine Corps. He's an on-duty, active-duty, paid-for Marine. Where he works it has nothing to do with the jurisdiction over him. And if the Marines had brought him back and put him in court-martial, they'd have stopped all that mess that took place because they didn't, which makes you wonder about what, what, how much the Marine Corps was involved in all that stuff, because they could have ended it overnight. I mean, I had to re when I was in the covert business, I had about 5,000 military that I wasn't personally responsible for, but I happened to be the senior person all over the world. Now, if one of them got in trouble, all I ever did was take the telegram that told me this guy was in trouble and hand it to the service he worked for, and they'd call him back and court-martial him, whatever they had to do. I had uh, one guy that works for, for work for CIA get caught in a theft, about $14 million theft that he worked because he could get equipment for nothing, and he sold it. So I just, when I got the records, I took them over personally, and I gave them to Mr. Dulles. I said, he's your man. And that guy, I never saw him again, disappeared. Well, that's the way things are supposed to work. Why didn't the Marine Corps go after North the first time he made his mistake and then either vindicate him and say that it wasn't his mistake, as might have been the case at that stage, or court-martial him? That's what the military's for. Well, I've been a commander in the military. I've had to court-martial people. Wasn't it because he was seconded to the NSC and it was, maybe it would be too embarrassing to... No, that has nothing to do with it. Uh, you, you, military people are assigned to colleges, they're assigned to businesses. Military people are assigned to all kinds of things, but they're still paid for. They're not permitted to take salary from somebody else. They're paid for by their, their service. They maybe don't wear the uniform every day, but they're known as a Marine. And the Marine is responsible, the, the, the book of court-martial, the Marine is responsible, and, and, uh, and, and the Air Force, I've had to take Air Force people up and, and have them tried. But I mean that urge to cover up that, that we see all over the government. <clears throat> oh, well, that, yeah, that but that's urge. abuse of the thing. The yeah, system, but the mean. system should work the other way, see? Yeah. And, and especially in the case of people at the, I mean, if, if it had been an Air Force guy, I wouldn't have let him stay five minutes and embarrass the air ball. I'm the one that, that mentioned Butterfield and got Butterfield knocked out of his job. I did that. I knew Butterfield. He was in my work. And when the son of a bitch was lying to people, 
I had to tell and they got him out of there. Well, it was done formally, just objectively. He didn't mean anything to me, but he was hurting the Air Force. So I, I, had, I told Daniel Shore, I said, that son of a gun, is, is, he's, he's, the, he's your problem. We'll get him back in the Air Force. Well, I had retired by then, but I knew the system. I knew how it worked. No, but that's, that's the way things are supposed to work. That's the only way you can keep control on people. Because, see, they get up in the NSC. They know nobody up there is their boss. They're just sitting there. Yeah. <clears throat> There's an awful lot of stuff done like that. And I, I think it's done on purpose. Because you know? <laughs> the Marine Corps knew he was from... They're, they're paying him every month, you know. <clears throat> That's right. When uh, Lansdale was was in the Air Force, you know, everybody figured he was in the Air Force. And uh, he got assigned to this office in the Secretary of Defense office well, under this General Erskine and uh, because the CIA wanted him down there. And then uh, a little later the, the uh, Air Force assigned me there as a senior Air Force officer uh, in, in, in the uh, area of the immediate office of Secretary of Defense. So we were in almost adjacent offices. Well, <clears throat> I was promoted to colonel about that time, and I was a good bit younger than Lansdale, so one day, sort of joking, he said, look, how the hell does old-timer like me get promoted to general when you guys are catching up with me? Because he'd been, he'd been colonel for quite a while. And I said, it's a cinch, Ed. You want to get promoted? He says, yeah. So I went up to my office, dictated a letter to my secretary, sent the letter to Alan Dulles, and with a little note over it, and I said, Mr. Dulles, if you sign this letter, and send it back to the Chief of Staff Air Force, Lansdale will be promoted to general. You know, you're paying him. I mean, Air Force, uh, CIA is paying him, not the Air Force. Think about damn what rank he wore. So by God, that letter came back. The, the, and and uh, old Kurt LeMay was the Chief of Staff of the Air Force. He called me up. He said, I don't know who, he had a list of guys who were going to be promoted to be Brigadier General. And he said, I don't know this guy down here, and the personnel people don't know. Who the hell is this guy Lansdale? <laughs> General, don't worry. That's Alan Dulles, man. You don't pay for him. You don't retire him. You don't have anything to do with him. He's working down there in cover stuff. Okay, he picked up his pen, signed the promotion for all the guys on it, including Lansdale. And I went down to Lansdale that afternoon. I said, hey, did you get your star yet? He said, no. He said, oh, what, what are you doing? I said, just sit tight. While I was there, the telephone rang. Personnel called him and said, come up and see us. So he was just a general on paper. He no, didn't, no, no. He was a CIA man. Well, he was a CIA, was a CIA man. He man. as I understand. Yeah. But and he wasn't really a general. Well, he was no, he wasn't, he wasn't real Air Force even. He wasn't even, you know, he was just nothing. A general so was his cover his, story. He didn't draw a pension after he retired. He, well, sure he did, was, but he drew it from CIA. Oh, that's what I mean. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. See, we were very careful not to intermingle the funds. He'd get a check every month, a green Air Force check, the regular government, but he'd have to turn it in to get his CIA check. Oh, see, I mean, see. And which was bigger. You know, it was more. But, you know, even his biographer calls me uh, uh, mixed up and confused for saying that Lansdale was, was not CIA, he was a legitimate Air Force guy. Even his biographer, have you seen his book uh, no. Curry wrote? Um, and who else? There was Secord CIA that was chief in the army. Uh, no, he's he's real Air Force. Secord, real. He, he used to be in my program. North used to be in my program, but further down, I you know, he was a kid. Um, he worked for Secord. He worked for this general called Adderholt. And Adderholt worked for me. Then Secord and North worked for him in Thailand. See so what they Secord did is. And North were doing th with Thailand and then they were well, doing drugs. they they found out what our system was. See if the agency come to me and they need uh, 50 rifles. I could fix it so that 50 rifles would be acquired from the Army for the Air Force. Well, the Army didn't give a damn given rifles to the Air Force. Then my Air Force unit was a phony one. All it was was a telephone and a drop so that when the phone rang, it said, I'm Major Johnson, you know, you know there's some guy there. Oh, uh, Johnson, your rifles are ready. Fine, thank you. Well, he's, he's on my guess size. So here we have 50 rifles. Now, nobody knew they'd been transferred. I could sell them. Nobody knew them. So Secord, who's a pretty sharp old bastard, and North figured that out. And every time there was an order, they'd increase it a little bit and sold them. And they were, they were millionaires. In fact, I think they still are. And so, so uh, Secord North, most likely in Thailand, aside from military, were also involved in the drugs. I don't know it, but I, I could assume it, because they're right in the middle of it down there. 
Sure. And when I was, um, it's in the lifeline. Uh, and then, you know, he goes into like, now he's working in Latin America and he's mm. caught red handed. And of course, that's another thing. He, he's making money in, in Iran to making money in Iran to to pay to to equip the Contras. The United States doesn't work that way. We never we never charge anybody a penny to equip the Bay of Pigs guys, the Cuban exiles. Mm -hmm. we, they they it's just, we it's a part of our activities. It's, we were funded in my work. We were funded to do things like that. He didn't have to sell anything to get what they're doing. They're, they're selling the stuff that was that was ostensibly going to Iran. They were selling it to them, sure. taking the money, put it in Switzerland. Sure, sure, and then use but, the cover and the, the Contras didn't get anything. They didn't need it. If we wanted to support the Contras, they would have been supported free gratis, but the government didn't want to support them. You know, and uh, the person that prints the catalog in, in uh, the person that prints the catalog is Bolivian in Santa Barbara. Uh, the, the printer of the catalog mm -hmm. is Bolivian. And he always thought the material was a little bit uh, bizarre when it would come in to be printed, until he went back to Bolivia, and at the time he was in Bolivia, the Bolivian papers were following a story in which an Australian and a French journalist were killed. And the whole Bolivian papers and all the transcripts saying that these they had stumbled upon and they had come upon all of Oliver North's cocaine fields and some of the control. And so we have those papers in which yeah. Bolivian papers discuss that kind of stuff. Yeah. And uh, not that they're Oliver North's cocaine fields, but you know whoever gets to run them, you know yeah. whether it's whether it's uh, you know Pablo Escobar or some some big thug that we we prop up, and yet they do all the work, and uh, we get this we get the nice. You know, nice There's a lot of activity there. You know, when after I retired, I worked for an aircraft company, and they sent me to Peru. So I worked in Peru for. I, I never, never really rented a house or anything. I lived in the hotel and would sort of commute back and forth. But I was there for nine months, working steadily. <coughs> and I was a civilian, you know. So I was walking across the main square, in the middle of Lima. And there's a beautiful old hotel on the other side, the, the, and called the Bolivar, the Boliv uh, Simon Bolivar, you know, that they call the Bolivar Hotel. And uh, right on the corner is a door you can walk into, and there's a marvelous bar. Every bar should be made like that. It's just low ceiling, dark, few lights, nice bar, nice comfortable chairs, wonderful bar in this old hotel. So I push open the door, and. It was broad daylight outside, and the, the bar is practically black, so I'm blind, and I get through the door. And I knew my way in there all right, and I hear some voices that I recognize. I say, oh, geez, I know those guys right over here. But I thought, I don't talk to them, they're agency. So I went straight ahead to the bar, fumbling my way through. And I get up the bar, and the bartender knows the, the, the symptoms that I can't see, and he says, what do you like to have? I said, well, I'll take a martini. And I stand there at the bar a little later a guy's right next to me and he has a cigarette out and he said uh, hey buddy you got a light and I looked to see and I knew him and I said I don't smoke but the bartender right away already had a lighter lit and he said you clean I said yeah I'm just civilian down here oh and I said how about you he says we're okay come on join us well without that I couldn't see so I went to join them three guys they were just down from La Paz Bolivia they had just come in <laughs> the day before they had gone down there and overthrown the government of Bolivia, it was Paz Estensoro, Estensoro, who was the president, and they threw him out. The way they did it is they put a big Lockheed Constellation up there at the airport and they sent him a note and said, you and anyone you want to take with you and anything you want to take with it, put it on that airplane, you're leaving. And he said, if you get on that airplane, you got no problem. Well. What they all knew was Esten Saro had been president of Bolivia twice before. He had been thrown out twice before. He's still alive. He had been Hitler's president of Peru when Hitler was injured. The Lufthansa airline, like our Pan American, was the CIA for Hitler, and they were able to get Esten Saro to be head of Bolivia. Bolivia is a very political country in that they overthrow guys easily as a matter of business, you know, and they're accustomed to it. <laughs> These three guys said that they had been running weapons to Barrientos, the Air Force general, in the back of the country by by taking superconnies into Peru and then light airplanes down to where they could leave them and bringing them back. Nobody knew they went in, no customs, no nothing. But Barrientos then had plenty of weapons, and so 
And then they went up to La Paz, where the ambassador and all were, and they made contact with somebody that knew Estensola real well, and they said, here's the deal, and if you don't think we mean it, Barrientos has got enough arms to outnumber your army two to one, and he's on his way in town now. He plans to be in here tomorrow morning. Estensola left. That night, they had a party for Barrientos, who's a real live wire. Really, he's kind of like Oliver Stone. I picture Stone and him very much alike. They had a big party that night. The next morning, they couldn't sober him up. They threw him in a shower, cold water, get him dressed, and they took him down the main street of La Paz. <laughs> he didn't know what was going on. He was still dead drunk, and he's the new new president of Bolivia. <laughs> and these, I like the analogy with <clears throat> I guess you've seen them. Yeah, these three guys that I knew, you know, had as soon as they saw that everything was all set, then they left it up to Betty Edels to take over, and they got out quick as they could, and they were down in Lima. I had known them for years. <laughs> they said, you know, the hell with invading Cuba. We know how to do it. Sure. Well, there's the whole thing about, you know, you have Somalia with all those weapons being flown in. You know, Mogad, you have, uh, you know, uh, the new problem in uh, uh, Rwanda. Yeah, yeah. And, you, all, know, all you know, they're just throwing weapons around, causing trouble. Mm. Yeah, Go well, and, and come, come out make, of making money. <clears throat> no, it's it's. Um, first of all, you, if you if you tried to make a movie that was absolutely true, nobody'd believe it. No. You know, that's we tried to make JFK absolutely true. Yeah, I had some fights with some of those script guys. They, they, they uh, well, it was all done by. I couldn't travel. You know, it was all done by paper. If I could have got to them, I, because <laughs> they still left some things in there that shouldn't have been in it. But it was all right. It came out pretty well. I thought so. You been to parties with Oliver, or you just know he's a live wire? No, I tell you, unfortunately, I know him so little that I, uh, you, you probably know him ten times better than I do, because I, 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 I come out of the hospital, and I'm upstairs, you know, unable to do anything, and he comes in, he comes upstairs and meets me there. That's one day. hospital? And I, I had had a heart operation, and I, and, I, and the, uh, the hospital, was, uh, I came back, and, and he met me, I was, I was in the house, I'm, I'm sorry, I was home. But I couldn't come down the stairs, so he came upstairs. There's a little sitting room up there, where my daughter's computer is. Is all it is. And he came up there, real nice. Came up, and we sat and talked. And that's one day. His great big long limousine filled the whole cul-de-sac. And uh, then he wanted to get uh, the everybody, the whole film crew, the cast and the writers and the, everybody together one time when the thing was going to start. And that was about, uh, with you. yeah, with January something. He wanted me to be there. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, I said, I think I can make the air trip. If you're real sure that I'm taken care of when I get there, I'll try it. I said, but I, I, I think I'll have to have first class thing because I don't want to have any trouble getting in and out of things. And so everything was arranged beautifully, including that he let me have my daughter fly on him from uh, Santa Fe and she met, she was at the airport when I landed. The timing was beautiful, and we went to the hotel. My daughter stayed with me, a friend and nurse, you know. And, and so she was there all that. Well, that was only two days, and I came back. So I met him those two days. After that, really, uh, until they brought the camera crew here to Washington for the interviews on the grassy knoll, well, um, <laughs> I hadn't even seen any of the, of the other people. I did meet them in the days, and, but I was so busy there, Garrison, and what they did is they set up an office for Garrison and me at a desk, and then they would bring people in, Costner and Sutherland, and then all the whole crowd. Uh, so that, like, the guy that was interesting was the young fellow that played uh, Oswald. Oswald. Gary Oldman. Yeah. He, because he didn't, he had the newspaper idea of Oswald, see, and I said, now, wait a minute. Oswald was a goddamn good Marine. He he could he was, he was a select Marine. We knew he was a credible guy. And right away you could see Oldman kind of standing up straight instead of and he <laughs> he plays the part right away. And then the little Polish girl that was um, Marina came in, and uh, uh, they uh, they they probably had met, but no more than that. See, and there's some little scene 
and all of a sudden he becomes a real superior Oswald instead of the, with the clown we hear about, and it affected her. You could see her, and they were, and they were both such perfect actors and actresses that right there in this little office with just Garrison and me, they changed. As we told them, you know, they, he said, what kind of a character is he? And she was talking about what kind of a girl was Marina, and, and they just fixed, it was, it was wonderful to see that. Well, I regretted I couldn't go back and stay closer to it, but really, other than letters, we, we exchanged tons of letters, and he's a very l literate type writer, and he can say what well, he wants. The introduction in your book was beautiful. Oh, yeah, what a deal. And uh, his letters are that way, too. So we know each other and have a very, I think, mutual respect for each other, but it's not a close social arrangement sure. or anything. Well, it's the same thing here. That's great. Because uh, he, he really he really does love you then a lot. He's a nice man. Hey Pat, you know I can't crawl across the floor. Oh come on in. <laughs>